Are you fed up with printing exercise programmes? Or horror? Drawing them? Solve every exercise prescription issue you can think of using Rehab My Patient. Thousands of pictures and videos of every movement you can dream up. Send by email or WhatsApp, translate into different languages at the click of a button. Don't take our word for it. Sign up for a three-month free trial now. Just go to rehabmypatient.com forward slash physiomatters. Philippa Butler, welcome to Chewing It Over. Why should we be bothered about the menopause? Well, Jack, thank you for having me, by the way. Um, we should be bothered because 47 million women in the world right now are going through this experience of menopause. And uh, that is something that we really cannot ignore. And women's health is something that is so neglected, really. Historically, it has been neglected in the research. And, uh, you know, not on my watch. That's what I say. So uh, this is this is stopping right now. Good. No, I like that. And and I uh, inadvertently stumbled into a pun, didn't I? Just before we went live, I said it's <laughs> quite did. the hot topic. And you said, yeah, good, good pun. Um, I was, um, I don't know if it was first made aware, but I was certainly it brought to my attention in, in more recent years, people like Gonya Donnelly, uh, Emma Brockwell, uh, Elaine Miller, were really helping me as an MSK clinician to realize that we needed to step up. They were willing to say that. They were just said, look, you, you need to, you, we need to be better on this. You need to factor these things in better. We're seeing stuff mm -hmm. as second opinions that should have been picked up within routine tendinopathy care. And, and it really did make me stand up and listen. And I've, I've done what I can to understand it more and more, but because it's a really emergent area of, of understanding, it sometimes feels difficult to, if, as a non-specialist uh, to, to keep up. So what do you feel are the things that we, now understand better about the menopause and how it should be considered more acutely by MSK clinicians especially? Mm. Well I, you know just to say I am an MSK clinician that is my sphere of expertise and uh, for many years as I was practicing this was not on my radar and you know I'm, I'm sorry about that now and uh, you know and I, I really am making amends with the work that I'm doing now because I had a horrific experience of menopause and so that was what prompted my research and, uh, and my interest, my own experiences of menopause. And, you know, how could I optimize my experience of life? Uh, and so that sort of set off this uh, cascade of events. And uh, but for, for musculoskeletal therapists, it might not be at the top of your list of priorities to consider. But uh, interestingly, I was listening to one of your podcasts yesterday with the, the gent who was talking all about tendinopathy. And, uh, and he mentioned all these potential risk factors that contribute towards the development of tendinopathy. And menopause was mentioned, and then we moved on. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and this is the thing, yeah. menopause. Okay, so remember menopause, but, but what and is that? Menopause. What's, what's sure. that all about? And what yeah. are the ramifications? And what we know is it's a systemic condition that we're dealing with that has ramifications for the brain, the heart, the blood vessels, the gastrointestinal system, the ur urinogenital system, and the musculoskeletal system. And so you can't separate this. You know, what you've got in front of you in the clinic is a person. It's not a, a body part, is it? You know, and Absolutely. I know I'm preaching to the convicted here, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, this is the thing we zoom in, but let's zoom out and look at this whole person that's sitting in front of us, uh, if they're a woman and, uh, you know, and even don't even necessarily think of a certain age because premature menopause happens, surgical menopause happens. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually it starts a lot sooner than we realize from the age of about 40 onwards, women are dealing with fluctuating hormonal levels that can have an impact on the musculoskeletal tissues. So you don't think of this as a condition of older age. Now, we're therapists. Okay, we're all therapists here, but we've got women in our lives, whether they're our mothers, our aunts, our sisters, or our patients. And so for me, it really is about women in the broadest sense, whether they're on our table or in our friendship circles. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's challenging, I suppose, when we're considering such factors is that we, 
as we become more considerate to these things being relevant and you start to, your spidey senses start going off mid subjective assessment, mm, early doors yeah, in a subjective yeah. assessment. Yeah. You'd be hopefully not so prejudiced as to then done so from understanding a date of birth or at the looks of someone, but you want to yeah. be factoring certain things in. And then when you do, you then don't want to rush to then think that everything therefore is, is resultant in that because then it can almost feel like everything's been put in that bucket. It's a, and I had a lot of sympathy. If you think about um, when, when we first started to learn about some of the factors affecting um, tendinopathy, we learned a bit about the fact that someone was smoking or whatever, mm. if there was smoking and then, and then to even mention that, that you could see the eyes roll into the back of their heads thinking mm. it's just another, I, I've, I've got a tennis elbow <laughs> and now they're blaming smoking. Everything's blamed on smoking. And I, yeah, I fear yeah. that, if we're not precise and we don't learn those lessons, then we want to make sure we don't just lump everything into this bucket of, oh, it's menopausal, as if therefore we can't do anything about it, which of course mm. isn't what we're suggesting. But no. how do you think we might skillfully navigate those sorts of things where we don't want to over imply or, or, or sort of infer that we therefore only a systemic change would be required and that the treatment isn't uh, available to them for the actual condition as well? Yeah, well, I mean, the treatment is always going to be necessary and appropriate, but to deliver the treatment in the context of this person in front of us is what we're talking about. And so this person may be sitting there in a complete daze, not knowing what's happening in the bodies. And we do them a service by helping them to understand the context of their health situation. So, so this idea that we, we zoom out and look at the whole person, their hormonal history, uh, you know, have they had trouble with endometriosis or, or a postpartum depression, you know, and to really get a flavor of this person's hormonal uh, pathway, if you like, um, and to know for them to, uh, to understand that we are not labeling them as, as, as anything in particular, and that what we're saying is that if we can understand better what's happening in your body, then we can deliver the treatments that are most appropriate for you. Not only that, we could help to signpost you to the services that you require in order for what, whatever it is that we're going to be doing to work as well as it possibly can. What do you think, therefore, would be obvious lines of questioning that we should make sure we pursue when noticing if said body senses have gone off mm -hmm. uh, what do you feel are sort of appropriate lines of questioning well i suppose it is difficult because we're all individual and uh, and it is different for every woman but you know hot flashes or hot flushes as we call them in this country is uh, is definitely a symptom that a lot of women will experience i think where it's important for us to make the distinction is that there are symptoms that they can experience that they didn't realize were associated with hormones. So all those 34 recognized, 35 recognized symptoms of menopause, the brain fog, fatigue, insomnia, and that's not just because you're having a hot sweat, mood disturbances, um, a genital urinary vaginal dryness you know um balance issues vestibular disturbances dry eyes you you name it i mean there's every bit of our bodies is struggling with the fact mm. that the estrogen levels are fluctuating and um and so it's important for us to have that level of understanding and and then to know that this this hormonal shift that is occurring is generating probably more than one musculoskeletal symptom, but that then that we often, you know, we go to the doctor, we can only tell them about one thing at once. Uh, yeah. You know, we get referred with one thing. And so the physio, well, I can only really talk about this one thing that you're talking about, particularly, it, you know, if you're talking about an NHS scenario. Mm. And uh, if there's anything else, it's not that we would neglect that. It's just that it wouldn't be the first thing that we're, we're uh, exploring with that client. So, but to to be aware that it's important for us to, to just um, look at this whole person in front of us, carpal tunnel, you know, that's something that people will, could be experiencing uh, joint aches and pains. And so if it's widespread as opposed to uh, um, 
a, an individual joint and also the fact that there's no history of injury is always going to point you to something a little bit more curious isn't it so and I suppose as well it's when they're not recovering more routinely from a, an innocuous injury or something yeah, that you'd yeah. expect to have resolved is yeah. another one isn't it where yeah 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 so, so insidious onset sometimes the obvious flag but then there's also then yeah, I thought you'd have been kicking on better than you did or they're developing a tendinopathy around a sprain or something like that, where it's just, mm. when you've got these these hormonal, when the, the hormonal fluctuation, as we're describing mm. it, um, do you, I, I don't need to necessarily, if you feel free to give it if you want to, like your hot take on the, um, on HRT, but it's just that, what do you feel is our responsibility for signposting for me that medical conversation alongside our therapy? So it doesn't need to be either or. It doesn't mean that we then back all the way off and, and, and just signpost. But mm. it's just, and I've had varying different people, including on the podcast, that have got a different sort of threshold of which they would then, you know, promote that conversation alongside therapy. What's your take? Well, um, my own personal view on this is that oestrogen is too important for us to be without it. And uh, so that's, you know, the bottom line for me. That's my choice. And um, that is my opinion. Now, the question really comes at what stage is this something that we start to consider as an intervention? And so... Um, you know, my research and my understanding is that these pathways that exist for estrogen in the receptor sites, um, th those receptor sites will become desensitized in the absence of estrogen. And so if we are without estrogen for too long, then, then introducing estrogen at a later date is not as effective. That's not to say it won't do something. So this is sort of, some emerging evidence and it's um it, you know we we have to know that estrogen is is something that women's bodies are designed to have so we'll say that and um and that estrogen fluctuation is the period of perimenopause so that's before menopause and that's why we get the symptoms predominantly because our hormones are going up and down and your body's trying to compensate for this lack of estrogen um, and so what, what estrogen therapy or sorry, hormone replacement therapy does at that stage is to kind of level us out a bit, but it's because it's giving us the estrogen that is lacking gradually, gradually declining. So, you know, you don't go along and then suddenly fall off a cliff. You, you know, it's gradually declining. And so supplementing those levels as you are experiencing fluctuating symptoms is going to bring you onto a par. And then the decline continues post-menopause. The levels are continuing de to decline gradually over a period of time. And uh, I love that picture where there's women filled with estrogen. And then by the end, when we're sort of 70 or 80, it's only in your feet. So, <laughs> I mean, it's obviously not only in your feet, is sure. it? But but I, I love that. Yeah. I love that visualization. So you, um, with that, though. Is there a, mm -hmm. do we have a, an assessment and titration of dose process that can make, be as, as accurate as this we're describing? Cause I, I like that mm. in theory, but in practice, mm. it, it can be a bit of a blunt instrument in my mm. experience from what I've, you know, sometimes I've, I've even regretted signposting where essentially it's then been yay or nay, you know, and there's just a, just a treatment dose that might not necessarily be appropriate for that person. So I certainly liked what you were describing in terms of supplementation, but how accurate is our testing? How well can we accurately then titrate a dose that's appropriate for that individual? Yes, well, it's a really good question. And currently testing in perimenopause when your hormones are fluctuating is not the, uh, what the NICE guidance supports. So that isn't going to happen while your hormones are fluctuating. If you wanted to have that test, you would have to pay for it. And I know that there is a day in the month when uh, it's an optimal time. And that, you know, if I wasn't postmenopausal, I might be able to remember what day that was. Um, so if you tested on a certain day in the month, you, you'd get the best reading possible. Um, but, you know, the more I listen and consume this um, longevity medicine that I consume online all the time, uh, getting your levels before before you start to suffer symptoms. So, uh, you know, what is your baseline? You're not going to find that out when you're when you're fluctuating. 
So that said, that would be the, the ideal, wouldn't it? But that's not happening. So if we think of it as a blunt instrument, we're more likely to feel that way. But if we think that the best way to diagnose menopause is from the symptoms that we suffer, and the best way to know whether HRT is working is whether or not it is addressing those symptoms, then we can feel a bit more confident in that approach, yeah? And, and I think we can be guilty of perpetuating uh, you know, the idea that it's not, this is not right, the way in which this is being approached, yes? Mm -hmm. So, but the evidence is that the best way to approach it is by symptom, man is through symptom management. Now, once a woman is stabilized, then we can start to think about testing. And I say we, I'm not a doctor, I can't be doing that. But we, you know, that is something that we could um, consult with other professionals around. But so once you're stable, then we can start to look at levels. And yes, there is a there is a sort of level, but uh, post menopause you're going to be maintained at a lower level because that's really more normal for your body. We won't be maintained at so uh, reproductive levels unless you've had a surgical menopause, and then that would be appropriate for that age of woman. Yes. So um, it, it does that answer your question adequately? It does. No, I, I, I think where I, where part of my question remains is then okay. if we are going off symptoms, mm. then you, you're unlikely to recognize by symptoms, maybe taking more than you needed to. You know, you'll end up with this window of a dosage that would be appropriate. And if you yeah. err on the side yeah, of yeah. higher, you'll get symptom response it seemed to mm. decrease, yeah. but it could have been twice as much as you needed. Whereas yeah. you then, if you if you erred on the side of less, then symptoms maybe would be, you yeah. know, it's not sufficient. But so I, I, I think how we'd manage that. Yeah, what I just said is that we will never be prescribed more than we need. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so the guidance is that the levels that you'd be prescribed and the maximum, if you had the maximum, it'll still be less than it would have been when you're in your reproductive years. Sure. So there is no overdosing on estrogen unless you take that pump and spread it all over your body of your own accord. And then we can't be held responsible for that, can we? No, I get it. Yeah, no, you're right. The, the, the prescribed dose wouldn't be in excess of anything. Yes, be, no, no. 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 Okay, no, no but, that, that makes sense. Yeah, and they'll always start with the lower dose and work up as as required. So, okay. um, yeah, I wouldn't be concerned about getting too much. Gotcha. And so when we're then factoring those sorts of things in, in a musculoskeletal service, mm. and is there, um, as well as the sort of detection, diagnosis, understanding and factoring in menopausal factors into that assessment process, mm -hmm. once we get into then the management of a musculoskeletal condition, are there hard and fast rules as to what we need to apply. Do we need to go steadier? Do we need to go lighter? Do we actually want to go heavier, but adjust the dosage down in terms of repetitions? There's lots of evidence out there at the moment that's mixing mm. around. What would you suggest would be sort of rules of thumb? Although of course we would tailor it. Well, absolutely. I, I think what is, has been perpetuated up to this point is doing less to, to feel less pain. And and so that approach isn't working. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is about challenging the tissues, because if we don't challenge the tissues, they're not going to change. Yeah. But in in that measured way. Mm -hmm. So for people and, and so you it's the person in front of you, then, isn't it? Is this an athlete or is it somebody who played netball at school and hasn't done anything for 40 years and sat at a desk all day? So you know, what are we dealing with? But ultimately, you know, the work that I do, I strive for people who have, uh, you know, I pride myself on the fact that I can work with anybody and people who have never done anything, I can, we can gradually get them there, you know, to a place where they are working with resistance or against resistance, whichever way you want to put it. Um, and that they are working on all those metrics that we know are so important. So strength, power, um balance coordination skills movement processing skills um you know at this I, I as i heard you say yesterday cortically rich experience of movement that we can tailor to the person in front of us and you know we know a few different things from science one is 
people will get more benefit from doing things that they enjoy. And um, and so you you know we can work with whatever it is that they that they're keen on doing, whether it's a new thing or an old thing that they want to revive. Um, and you know, and and I've worked with so many people who've never exercised before and come to this place where I met a lady on Saturday evening. I hadn't seen her since before COVID, and she'd come to my Pilates classes and she said, "Oh gosh, I absolutely loved Pilates." And and I'm thinking that's amazing, you know. This person who had had really no exercise history and in a, a mid middle life came to movement and absolutely loved it. Now COVID came along and got in the way of that, but anyway, this uh, you know I happened upon her, and now we're going to get back in the saddle with the with the thing that she loves. Um, so well, that's so often you the know, case, isn't it? You've yeah, got to get well, reengaged, get mm-hmm. them, get them back fired up. yes well exactly so uh so so the fact is there's no one thing social media would love us to believe that we had to do high intensity interval training social media would say no forget that all you need to do is lift this weight four times and you'll be fine well you know what none of this is true none of it we need a holistic approach to movement practices, and that includes cardiovascular output. Uh, you know, we know that has anti-inflammatory effects. Exactly, yeah. Well, so, that, one of the things that you, you've mentioned mm-hmm. there is that the approach for too long has been then almost just a kid gloves approach. Mm. It, it, it's It's been just wind it all the way back. And so it, it ends up being like, really low dose, really easy mm-hmm. stretching programs, yoga, Pilates, which of course have their role, but if they are in, in isolation, then it's, it's something that unfortunately it's a bit like, I mean, like, um, and, um, my, my good friend Jim will be ranting at this if I don't mention it, but in rheumatology services, it was just, oh, yeah. everyone got hydrotherapy because God forbid we might load them up. And it was just that the evidence never supported that. It was just, oh, inflammation. And so that we were mm. heard on the side of not. And mm. so it was almost like the first response to understanding these things a bit better, which is a compassionate response is kid gloves rather mm. than thinking, mm. actually, no, we need to still challenge tissues to change them. We still need to sort of stimulate uh, an anti-inflammatory response that would also mm. be useful for hormonal profiles mm. as well is mm. to actually get out of breath now and again. So yeah, um, yeah. The, 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 the one golden rule is don't just do less for the sake of doing less. There's nothing kind about that. No. And, and I'm afraid you did say something that I'm going to pick up on here, oh, which do. is, uh, Easy things like Pilates and yoga. <laughs> okay. No, that's true. They can be pretty yeah, difficult. I yeah, no, the, the thing is, it, it is um, it is the default for the reason that oftentimes we don't want to hurt people in group classes. You know, you, you take the, the lowest common denominator, you, you layer on levels of challenge, um, but, you know, invariably everybody tries it, whatever it might be. But but these are disciplines that I so often hear dismissed as right. um, as not difficult enough. I, I've got a Pilates reformer in that conservatory. I'm in my I'm in my house. This is my home clinic oh, here. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in my conservatory, I have a Pilates reformer machine. Now, I mean, it doesn't get much harder than that. I have to tell you. Um, so it's really the choices that we make with these movements. I use rubber bands like you going out of fashion. Uh, we, we use hand weights. Now, we're not doing um, heavy, hard weights, but we are loading the tissues. We are using all those mechanical principles that we learn as physiotherapists, long lever, short lever, you know, um, at, to make it as hard, single leg focus, you know. So you can make this stuff difficult if, if you really want to, if you're really thinking about it. And yoga and Pilates are, for me, integral in uh, movement and function preservation for the future. So you can be a runner, you can be a cyclist, you can be a triathlete. I've done these things. Um, But if you want to carry on after 50 and into your 70s, which I do, I know that these movement approaches are integral in a um a body insurance policy and that's what i call it i like so, that anyway. that's great no that's a great great line i hope you didn't think i was being dismissive of not principles. at all no i no. think one of the things we can sometimes do as well is then 
interchangeably use low intensity with EMD yes. and that's not sure. right. Whereas I suppose in a, in a, when I was thinking about HIIT training or, or, or a, say a <laughs> yeah. cardio or going for a run, then it's, it's at least a different uh, approach. And we need to try and, I mean, there was a great piece in I'm sorry to plug an MSK mag piece here. It's oh, a bit no cheesy, but, um, but Sue Julian's wrote a great piece about stretching um, mm. in an MSK mag recently, where she was explaining about the research is increasingly pointing towards that, having real interesting vascular elements to it, whereby actually that facilitates cardiovascular mm. growth and gain. So, well, is, yes. Uh, and I, I, I expose myself to that same sort of principle that, you know, with yoga, really strong stretching does condition muscles it, it doesn't just uh make you bendier you know so sure yeah. and that that's something that you no know, i remember as a team we were reading sue's piece and uh in the editing suite and thinking wow this has really confronted mm. us with uh against the bias and against the grain <laughs> and so you then end up sort of reintroducing it into practice and realizing that that can really attenuate better results so you regret having turned your back on certain things mm. so no it's uh it's definitely interesting one thing i really wanted to sort of pick up with you if i could is we've talked a lot about what msk clinicians should mm. uh, be bearing in mind and what they might consider both in terms of assessment and treatment and management. But I've been thinking increasingly, because I spoke to Jennifer James, who's appearing on a, on a Physio Matters special soon, and uh, it's not been published yet. But in that uh. conversation, I ended up in a situation where I was talking about obesity with her. And we said about the fact that there are, there are factors affecting musculoskeletal conditions that we need to consider when, when considering obesity. But there's also this idea of well, primary weight loss services what is physiotherapy and msk clinicians role in that and what could we do better mm. is this another space in which instead of just considering the coming to see you primarily for pain and injury and please factor this in is there a space for us as sort of health coaches that happen to be physiotherapists by background having primary services where people are struggling with the menopausal symptoms are keen to understand their body as it changes and that's the primary reason for them coming in mm. Yes, and this is the work that I've been pursuing over the last four years, really. Uh, I haven't got to that point yet because I, I keep coming upon the stumbling block of not having a doctor that I can work with at the moment to refer people wow. on to. And I, and I really want to have that pathway uh, hammered out, if you like. But, nice. um, but yes, it's, you know, physiotherapists are so well-placed because we, of all the professions are the ones that will take this helicopter view of people's uh, physical capacity. This, uh, you know, exercises in with the bricks as physiotherapists. And, uh, and I really, you know, I've really endeavoured in my career to be able to straddle that boundary between rehabilitation and physical conditioning so that we can take people all the way through that journey um, and even if you just save yourself for the rehabilitation part and have some trusted source that you hand them on to, you know, but mm. uh, running these uh, Pilates group classes, yoga group classes uh, in and alongside the private individuals that I work with is is a really helpful um, you know, it flows both ways. They come to the group classes. I'm not saying that I break them, but things happen, don't they? You know, <laughs> the life happens. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And so then I'm I'm there and on hand, and I can deal with those. And to be honest, that what I find is because they come to me so quickly, you know, we we get things back on track, and uh, and the and they're back in the group sessions and and firing on all cylinders. Um, and then for people who are coming from nowhere with no movement experience. We work as in, with individuals. I work with them as individuals. And then they, you know, I'm very happy for them to take a bit more agency and, and come along to a group session, meet other people, offer that community of, of people. Primary menopause symptoms. I think what I would suggest is, and, and actually this is not my um, term at all. Uh, Vonda Wright is an American orthopedic surgeon and she, uh, has coined the term the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. And I this is something that I feel physiotherapists are very well placed to um, to approach because it is uh, women with uh, multiple joint aches and pains, tendinopathies, um, uh, yeah, arthralgias, and then put that together with fatigue, put that together with... Um, mood disturbances where women are getting anxious and depressed and, and feeling like this is 
the start of the end, really, you know, for some women, that's how it feels. Um, but, but the, um, you know, these elements, the sarcopenia, the osteoporosis, if we can get ahead of this stuff and provide women with that information that, um, and permission really to push the envelope and to understand that pain is not always about damage and that um, the, the more we uh, think about our pain, the worse it's going to feel, you know, and so to equip them with all these tools. And you mentioned health coaching and it's really, um, you know, going down that avenue of supporting people to explore movement as medicine, to tackle what are I mean, this is costing the health service a lot of money, women falling over and uh, breaking a hip, you know, ultimately is costing the health service a lot of money and people a lot of pain and uh, and heartache. And, and so to arrest that functional decline that that occurs, you know, that some people think is inevitable. And do you know what? It isn't. This is the thing that I am selling. <laughs> you were buying yeah. by any chance yeah. but you know what I mean sure. uh let's let's help physiotherapists are so well placed to prevent this physical decline and frailty and uh, empower people to live this long active lifestyle um should they wish to and and not feel like there's an inevitability around aging that's right it's that fatalism isn't it mm. that when you can get people the penny to drop that that needn't be the case and that they mm. needn't needn't just manage decline and they yeah, can yeah. kick on and they can feel yeah, yeah. like themselves again they can feel younger again that is such an exciting premise and, and something that i think physiotherapy is a really well-placed profession to do so um so no, right. i'm excited excited by that well sure. you know and the other thing is and this is true that you know from all the research that i've done i, I thought it was true and now i'm no more certain than i could be that it is true yeah. that there is not one symptom of menopause that physical activity will not improve. So our um, thermal regulation is improved by exercise, sleep, it, stress management, you name it. There, there isn't a tissue, a structure, a cellular process that isn't somehow enhanced by movement and exercise. So, you know, with that, Okay, HRT is an option. It's a choice. It's it's not for everyone. Not everyone chooses it. I do. I feel it's important. But uh, you know, if if not, if that's not possible or it's not a choice, movement is the next best thing. You talked about nutrition. Of course, they go hand in hand. You know, that they're bedfellows that live together, and so they should. But uh, but but movement is medicine for menopause. That is of that there is absolutely no doubt. No, for sure. And it's uh, it's so it's so therefore important for us to find an appropriate tailored dose to that individual mm -hmm. for what might yeah. suit them, both in terms of type and intensity. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So thank you so much for catching up with me today. Could you tell people where they might find out a little bit more about you and uh, and, and, and what you're uh, active on in social media? Oh, well, I'm precision.co.uk online. And you know what? That's always the one question I fail to prepare for. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Precision UK on Instagram. I'm on all the platforms because I really am keen to spread the message. I've got my Precision um, Moving Through Menopause podcast, and that's on Spotify okay. and uh, Apple Podcasts and, and on YouTube. I've got my YouTube channel, uh, Move with Philippa, uh, Precision UK. So Precision, oh, and guess what? I did a clever thing. I spelt it with a Z. With a Z, I was going to say. I was just going to say. I know it's with a Z. In fact, I can see it in behind you as well. Precision. Oh, it is. Z Z yeah, with a Z. No, yeah. I love it. No, it's, it makes it memorable. <laughs> no, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, and thanks for banging this drum so proudly. It's an important area and one that uh, it's quite exciting to see how it's all developing, and and mm. and that the immense suffering that we can decrease and the and the clarity we can bring. Uh, we are perfectly placed for for helping with that, and it's such mm -hmm. a positive area. Uh, of, of practice at the moment and thanks for your yes. contributions to it oh you're very welcome thank you so much for having me no problem at all take care here at physio matters we think physio matters 
Become a member today and access the biggest MSK library on the planet. Access at home, work or in the gym to make sure your CPD conditioning is elite. Physio-matters.com. More content than will fit on a deadlift bar.